The prosecution wants you to guess. They do. They want you to guess. And that is not the law in the United States. It's not the law in Kentucky. It's not the law that the judge read. If you look at those instructions, they say the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Chris did it. That's what the instructions say. That's the law. Not speculation, not maybe some other phantom person out there in the world, but the prosecutor bears the burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Chris did this, and they can't, and they haven't, because he did not do this. The most ridiculous piece of evidence I've ever heard in my life. The most obviously planted thing I've ever seen is this. It is actually ridiculous. Whoever left this at the Phillips home has seen too many movies. Not only is it planted, but it's planted by someone who thinks they're clever. Because if you are killing Calvin Phillips and you want people to think it is Christian Martin, what better way than to bring this item and place it there next to the wallet of the man you've just killed? So Joan has the motive, she has the opportunity, and she has the means. Her behavior beforehand shows that she's the sort of person who can do it, the sort of person who uses court to get back at people, to attack people. The sort of person who uses court is the same kind of person who would plant evidence. And we know that her behavior after is suspicious. And we know Joan had the phone. Joan had the phone. I mean, that, that's, that's a, a great fact for the defense. It's one of these strange facts in this case which has totally baffled and confused me, which, again, if the jury feels the way I feel, it, it, it's, it's going to be difficult for them to figure this out, number one, and number two, find evidence beyond any and all reasonable doubt. Because that, that's the burden uh, that prosecutors have. It's a tough burden. Even on cases where you have good evidence, it's a tough burden to meet. Let's bring in our guest, joining us, Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae, who's in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, inside that courtroom today. Also with us, the attorney represented Jody Arias, also the author of the book series Trapped with Ms. Arias, Kirk Nurmi. Uh, great to have you here, Kirk. Julia, let's begin with you. Um, first, give us the latest off the top here, top of the hour. Uh, what have we heard? Uh, they ordered some dinner. Did they debate dinner for like an hour before? Is that why they're ordering it so late? This is the first time we've heard from the jury all day. They've been deliberating for six plus hours and around 740 this evening. They informed the court that they would like the court to order them some dinner and they are still deliberating. So that's the extent. Everyone else is just on standby right now. Everyone has their own camps there in the courthouse. The doors, of course, closed to the public at this point. It has been since 430, but the victim's family members, they are all downstairs. This is a two story courthouse. Uh, the defense team, the supporters of the defendant, some of them are upstairs and some of the members of the defense team look a little nervous just in watching them. But everyone is wondering how long are we going to be here tonight and are we going to hear a verdict tonight? Uh, Kirk Nurmi, let me ask you about this moment, right, where you're waiting for that jury to come back. Um, is there communication between uh, uh, attorney and client during this time 
What do you tell them? How do you prepare them? Because 12 people who they never met before will decide uh, the rest of his life. Yeah, you know, Vinny, obviously it's a very tense moment, both for the defendant and the attorneys, particularly in this case where I feel like we have a defense attorney who believes in his client's innocence. So there may be some communication, but really pretty much everyone's on pins and needles. There may not be much to say other than just sitting there hoping and waiting. And what's interesting about this is we've gone almost seven hours now, not a single question, nothing. So we know the jury is probably in some sort of intense discussion. And if they're ordering at 740, you know, it takes a while for the food to get there. Then you've got to eat it. And I don't think they're going to eat and run. My guess is they, they'll eat to go a little bit later. Uh, Julia, uh, two, two questions here. Any limitations on how late they can go, number one? And number two, uh, what, if anything, did we see in terms of a reaction from this jury to the defense closing argument? As far as what limitations Judge Atkins has given them, he did not give any on the record. He just sent them off to deliberations and informed them of how to contact the court. That's not to say that if it gets really late that he may not send word to them that they do need to come back tomorrow. We don't know. But he is going to give a 15-minute pep pad time if he does get word from the jury to allow all of the parties to reconvene inside the courtroom. As far as how they reacted to the defense uh, closing arguments today. You didn't see a lot of writing, but they were interested. They were engaged. It's a lot of information that they've already heard from the defense because the case in chief was the most recent thing that they've heard in this case. Uh, but we noticed when they were walking out for their break before they were able to come back and hear the closing arguments from the prosecution, they did not make any eye contact with the victim's family. Sometimes you do see them look over, but they were all looking down on the ground. Kirk, let me ask you about one thing the defense mentioned there, that Joan, right? They're pointing the finger at Joan. Joan had the motive, opportunity, and the means. Did she have the motive? Was there a true motive for her to murder three people? Well, I think when you go back and you look at everything she's done, I mean, she's she's exhibited some antisocial signs, right? She's committed the crime of bigamy. We heard about dead animals in the mailbox. We've heard about her threat to get her former husband. So, yeah, did she have the motive? Yes. And like you said, she had the opportunity. She had the phone, Vinny. She had the phone. Of course, she had the motive. She was so interested in getting Mr. Martin and this is, and it didn't work in the court martial, and she went but it, forward. But it wouldn't have in worked in the case. court martial because, according to the defense, she murdered the key witness in the court martial. So why would she undermine her own plan? That doesn't make sense to me. Let me ask you, Julie Janae, opportunity. Where was Joan that day? Do we know? Vinny, can I first tell you that I just got word that the food has arrived for the jury, so they will be or are eating right now, but they are still deliberating. We haven't been told that they've stopped deliberation. So eating through their dinner or working through their dinner, rather. Uh, repeat your question again. I'm sorry. Well, it, the dinner got there, as I predicted, within about 30 minutes, right? It's 10 after. So I got that right. I didn't get the it verdict did. right yet. Okay. Uh, opportunity. Where was Joan during the, the, the time, this, this window of time that the murders took place? Oh, that's why I didn't know the answer to your question, because we don't know. There it was not a full investigation in the trial of Joan Harmon. Yes, we know that there were investigators that talked to her, that they sent in information to ballistics and to, well, not necessarily ballistics, but to the state lab that had to do with Joan Harmon to determine if her hair matched certain things that they found. But as far as in this trial, whether we had a law enforcement officer come to the stand and tell us how they cleared Joan Harmon, that simply didn't happen. So if she did have opportunity or if she didn't, that was not made clear to this jury. Wow, that's, that's problematic. That does give her opportunity in the juror's eyes, whether it's, it, she actually had opportunity. We have no idea because we don't know where she was. Um, the means, how, how would she have the means? Where, do, do, is there any testimony that she owned guns? Well, there's testimony that she had access to the defendant's gun. Now, whether she had access to wait, his wait, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. on the weren't they split at that point or not split yet? What was what was the situation? Where where was she living? Where was he living? Where were the guns? They were definitely split. The Phillips actually helped her move out and helped her secure housing. So she was in a different location. 
But I think the defense wanted you to believe, one of these jurors to believe that she would be in possession of a firearm. She regularly had a firearm when she lived with uh, the defendant. She was, according to one of the witnesses, she carried one around in her waistband when she was in her house. So I think the insinuation they hope that the jury makes is that she would be someone who would carry a gun and she liked the Glock that her past husband had. Not really husband because she already had a husband that she hadn't divorced, but that was that reasonable doubt that the defense was sowing during their case in chief. All right, we've spent uh, way too much time on the defense, but that tells you what's going on in this case, doesn't it, folks? Uh, let's listen now uh, to part of the prosecution's closing argument. Time was running short. The court martial trial was set for December 1st. Time was running short. And try as they might, by sending investigators to try to tear apart Calvin Phillips' statement. He told you he hired two private investigators. As try as they might, that trial was still going forward with Calvin Phillips, as you heard from Major Garrett, as the critical witness. The case would never have been brought without Calvin Phillips. He was ambushed. Somebody who was there, somebody who had come over and would be a witness. Collateral damage. He was eliminated quickly. And then he went in the house and ambushed. Pam was on the phone with Marlene on her landline in the foyer for seven minutes, according to the phone record. Pam, Marlene heard the scream. Not a scream of pain, because it hadn't happened yet. A startle, a startle. Right from behind. I, I'm buying that, but the question is who did it, right? That's, that's the problem. It, it seems that uh, Pam and Ed uh, both walked in on something. I mean, all the evidence uh, points towards that, especially the testimony of the neighbor, um, Marlene uh, LaRock. So um, let me ask you, Julie J, anything from this jury during the prosecution closing argument? Well, Vinny, we saw a different Barbara Whaley than we've seen in the, during the rest of this trial. She was fierce. She was accusatory. She was specific about exactly how this happened. The jury was taking note of some of the things that she was saying, but I don't know if it's because she went second, because we ran over into lunch, but you saw a lot of yawns. You saw jurors who were tuned out. It just seemed like it went too long for them, even at the very, very end of her closing argument, which had some of the most emotional moments. I noticed one juror who has been pretty alert. His head was completely down, 90 degree angle, and he did not perk up until he heard uh, the attorney sit down, essentially. And, and usually prosec you know, prosecutors get to go second. It's supposed to be an advantage. And, and you know, get to go last, have that final word. But sometimes if you don't have the sandwich where they go first and last, uh, like this, that's the way I did it when, when I was in New Jersey. The prosecution would just go second. All right, Julie Janae, here's the deal. You've got to get something to eat, right? You've got to make sure that you are, because the jury's eating. Uh, you're allowed to eat, too. Um, They've got sandwiches, by the way, not okay. pizza. Okay. You hear anything. Let us know. We'll put you on the air and let the viewers know exactly what's happening in Kentucky. All right, Julie Janae in Kentucky. Kirk Nurmi's going to stay with us.